swear to God, this is only the second time I've ever presented, and yet MAGFest always makes me feel welcome. So I appreciate it. Uh, and if you would do me one favor, uh, return the appreciation. If you see a staff member, if you see folks like way in the back busting their humps on the, on the audio visuals, make sure to say thank you because they are busting their humps. Give it up, give it up, you have KB team. So I'd like to introduce myself. I'm gonna be sort of moderating these two, God help me. Uh, my name is T. Morris. I'm a science fiction fantasy author, uh, both, uh, both uh, uh, New York published as well as self published, and I also podcast my fiction. And we are here to talk about storytelling and gaming because I call myself a reluctant gamer. And I say reluctant because if I gamed as much as I wanted to, I wouldn't get any of my books done. Uh, sure. Sure. So, I, so I get very picky about the games that I play. But I would like to go ahead and have the other panelists introduce themselves uh, to my farthest over here. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Robert Aldrich. I am also a novelist and serialist. I don't have a podcast. And after hearing yours, I, perfection has been reached. Why would we need additional <laughs> ones? Um, I'm uh, self-published and small-published as well. I used to be a harder core gamer, and I'm a less harder core gamer, gamer but not quite a casual gamer. Um, I just got Turn of Soul on Final Fantasy XII if, for the like four of you that have done that. And if you have, yeah. you need to reevaluate some life decisions. <laughs> then, sir? Nick? Uh, so my name's Nick Kelly. I am a longtime gamer, sometimes reluctantly, usually whenever I'm gaming with him because he has no sense of direction. I, I don't, I don't, I don't. I, I, we, have a, we have a small crew in a game I'll be talking about later. Uh, the, uh, the guy who, we, we have that one guy who knows everything, we call him Wick, Wickeredia, because his name is Nobilis Reed, so he's Wickeredia. Um, Nick has a tendency to like to punch people in the face, so he's called the Punisher. And due to my amazing sense of direction, my, my call sign is wrong way. That's right. <laughs> So when I'm not gaming, I am an author. I'm a self-published author. I have a uh, cyberpunk series that I write, and I write urban fantasy with my wife. And bunch it. And uh, also co-founder and co-host of the Geek Wolfpack podcast. Right. Wait, that's, Ding. that's you? I didn't realize that. Yeah, we do ADHD D&D. So if you want to hear people ridiculously gaming while they should not be drinking as much as they are, then you should listen. Woohoo! <laughs> Great. Yeah. I think we actually gave a plug for fanboy glass because I have that we I have that big stein and I just fill it up with an IPA and I'm and I start off going, okay, let's get in here. And then by the end of the stein, I'm just like, what am I shooting at now? <laughs> but um, so the three of us, we we have that writing background, and one of the things that uh, we want to talk about before we get into this panel is what makes a good story. What is it about storytelling that what what works for for each of us? before we get into the games that we want to highlight. So uh, that's my first question uh, as, as a writer, and I'll start with Rob. Uh, Robert, what are the contents of a good story? There are many contents, oh, yeah. and, and it will depend on the story what is really important versus what is not. Um, in my writing and in video games, and I'm currently reviewing the Transformers series from Gen 1 all the way through Robots in Disguise, and what's become very clear to me is how important consistency is. Even if you have a wacky, crazy, just inane world full of lunacy, there still has to be an internal rhythm. There still has to be an internal consistency. Uh, look at movies like any of Mel Brooks' comedies. Look at Airplane, the work of the Zuckerman brothers. And even movies that are that zany, there's still an internal logic. The game that I selected for this is going to be a wonderful example, and I'll leave you guys in suspense about that. But I feel like internal consistency, when it is absent, oftentimes you'll, you'll think that something's wrong with the story, the movie, the book, the comic, whatever, but you won't be able to put your finger on it. It's like really good anatomy in an artist. Even if an artist is amazing at Photoshop and has incredible penmanship, if they do not have a good grasp of anatomy, there will be just something wrong you can't quite point at. That's what internal consistency is for me. And I think that's one of the key elements to a good story. That is an awesome analogy because there's a, there's a guy in, in, in the vendor space downstairs and he's wearing uh, a T-shirt that has an album cover on it. And I won't, won't say who it is because if, if, as soon as I tell you this, you guys will never unsee it. And it's, uh, it's a picture of a person's face. And somebody pointed it out to me about 10 years ago 
that the eyes are like this. And now you can't unsee it, right? So, but it's like that. As soon as they pull you out of the story, you're gone. They, you can't get back into it. And so I think that that's the consistency and, and, and maintaining uh, believability and, and maintaining the story itself, I think, are absolutely huge. And, and I was a good boy. I didn't tell him that but I because I don't want to break his heart because you'll never not see and it again. And he wanted that shirt. Remember, he said he told us he, re he, he, he really wanted that shirt. Claude, you are one sentence away from completely ruining that illusion. I know. That's, that's a, a lot of power, my friend. I know. And well, because he has something that I wanted to buy and he won't sell it to me if I ruin his shirt. So. You could get a discount that way, though. <laughs> you could get a sweet discount that way. We could get a discount for all you people. That'd be awesome. Okay. So, yeah, for, for me, when I, th when, I, but when I think of consistency in, in, a, in a story, I think it's not just in the storytelling. You bring up a lot of zan uh, zaniness, and uh, one of the things that, that popped into my mind was a, an old classic. This is way before any of you people were born. I, I take that back. It's before I was born. I saw it on television. There's a movie called It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. Oh, good. Yeah, thank you. Okay. And <laughs> Yeah, people who watch TCM um, at 3 a.m. Yeah. Um, Whoever and just cheered, go thank your parents. Yeah, um, <laughs> but, but in that film, there's all kinds of insanity going on, but every character is true to themselves. When the characters, do, when the characters betray you, that's where I think that storytelling fall, falls short. Uh, it's not just a storytelling from a, from, a, from a plot point of view, but it's also storytelling from a character point of view. And as, as, as Rob said earlier, I think that you've got, you've got some stories that, that weigh more on the, on the characters. You, you know, when you look at stories like Rogue One, when you look at, uh, uh, when you look at uh, Tomorrowland, when you look at, at... I knew that was coming up. Thank you. <laughs> when, when you look at films like... Uh, um, there's one that's uh, I, it's on the tip of my... Oh, Kubo and the Two Strings. Mm. Uh, if you haven't seen Kubo and the Two Strings, do yourself a favor and watch that. It's, it's some amazing storytelling. Um, but even in video games, whether you're playing the character or you're uh, controlling a character, if the, so long as the character is consistent with, with the decisions that you make, um, I think that is when you see good storytelling in video games. And... Um, oh, he's got what, oh, what oh, this. Oh. What this particular, what, what this particular uh, panel is about is not necessarily yeah. we're going to just uh, <laughs> spend a whole bunch of time throwing out titles of different video games to try to one-up each other. Um, it's not going to be it's not going to be that type of panel. What I've asked of the panelists and of myself is that we pick two games, and these are two games that we've played and two games that we believe in, and then we talk about them, preferably an old school game and a new school game. And I guarantee you, the six games that we have up here, some of you, you may go, oh, yeah. Some of you go, they're on crack. <laughs> but um, just keep in mind that we only have so much time to do the panel. And I wanted to not just have it be a, a, an onslaught of titles. I want it to be a real deep dive into what we, as authors, think make really good storytelling. So we're going to kick it off with, with, uh, with Roberts, too. Right. And um, Robert... This is a, this is a year. We're going to kick it off with this particular, yep, this particular game. I didn't think I picked that one. Yeah, you did. Did I? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, We're off to a fantastic start. Excellent. That explains so much about the slideshow you sent me. <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> it um, also explains that little note. Hey, if you want me to make any changes, ask for them. So. You know, yeah, this is great. How's your improv, Rob? <laughs> oh, well, no, I don't mind at all. I, I originally I had I, I had wanted to do one story that as kind of a cautionary tale about how a really good story can be told ineffectively. Um, but I'd also thrown this one out because this is possibly the greatest video game story ever told. Who has played? <laughs> yeah. Um, in short, if you have played Final Fantasy VI or Final Fantasy III, we're not going to nitpick. It is one of the great masterpieces of video gaming, not just of the 16-bit era, not just of the Super Nintendo, not just of JRPGs, just of gaming in general. This is one of the most beautifully crafted stories. If you have not played Final Fantasy VI, I don't know what you're doing with your life. I really don't. Um, no you, you need to get on, you, 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 you gotta make something happen. Um, go with, you know, um, you don't need to eat every day to make this happen, come on. Um, but this is a beautiful story 
And part of what makes it so incredibly investing is that not only are the individual characters, Saris, Sabin, Cyan, Edgar, Locke, every single character, big and small. That's Final Fantasy V. I know. Okay. I know. Roll with it. All right. No problem. Um, if you had looked at the damn presentation, you would have said, that's Final Fantasy V. I, I, did, I thought this was connected to somebody else had called Final Fantasy VI. Ow! I was like, okay, don't yell at me. I'm fragile. I just had to make it through DC traffic. <laughs> I feel like a volleyball net right now. Oh. <laughs> anyway, um, well, the, the Final Fantasy V and Final Fantasy VI can go together. See, I saved it. F because Final Fantasy V has five great characters that their stories are very, except for Bats, who's useless. But, Choco <laughs> but Boko is really fun, so you know what it counts. Um, but five really great characters. Final Fantasy VI has 39. Um, and I honestly, I was joking, but I'm not, now that I start counting characters, I'm not sure. They might rarely have that many playable characters. It's a truly amazing menagerie of stories that not only run cohesively, every character has their own complete story arc, but they also all interact, intermix, interconnect. You are constantly finding yourself with two and three people whose lives have intersected in new ways. So by the end of the game, you do not have an adventuring party. You have a veritable family because every single character has connected with every single other character in some fashion, big or small. Sometimes the interactions are only a single scene. Um, Edgar and Shadow, I think, only have one scene together. And because it's Shadow, it, it may not even happen because he's a pseudo-hidden character. But every character comes out. And then, uh, is it Ceres Ceres or Celeste? I keep mixing that up. Don't, guys, come on. This is MAGFest. Just yell me the answer. Celis. There we go. Okay. Celis is, is very much the one cohesive unit that's traveling through all of these stories. The story will start with her, and it ultimately ends with her. And it is truly phenomenal. And again, this is on a 16-bit game. Very limited dialogue. Very limited emotive capabilities with these sprites. Very limited storytelling capacity in every metric we have today. And yet, this is a game that still holds up 20, 25 years later. This is truly one of the great masterpieces of gaming. And if you have not checked it out for the story alone, never mind the fantastic gameplay, never mind the really immersive world and graphics, even for a 16-bit engine, this is a transformative game that will redefine the medium for you. All right, your turn. No, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I want, I want to, I want to counter with that. I'm not Woo! following that. Woo! <laughs> so don't hold back. What do you really think? Um, so, so you, you say it's transformative. I'm sorry. Hang on, one thing. And Kefka's <laughs> a bastard. <laughs> So, so you say it's transformative. What is it about the storytelling? Is it, is it that, 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 that emotional investment that the gamer makes in playing the game? It is the manner in which you glean all information about the world from the characters. There is very little overarching narrative. There's very little narration from any, out, from any source except from the, player, from the characters that you are p playing and controlling. So without having a first-person perspective of the story and of the world, you're grasping the magnitude of everything that is happening. Seeing the two royal brothers, um, is it Sabin and Edgar? I always get the three of them, Sabin, Edgar, and Cyan. I, I always get their names mixed up. Um, if only you what? had a room full of people who could answer that for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the two royal brothers, they go back and forth constantly. One's the monk fighter, the other's the knight, who randomly has a chainsaw. Okay, sure, whatever. Um, Don't we all? Yeah, I guess so. But the, their entire friction contributes nothing to the story. It has no bearing on any of the overall tale, and yet you become completely invested in it just by watching their dialogue, just by watching their interactions. And these dialogues are one or two dialogue boxes yeah. long. Yeah. And it's excellent just by how the story is told through the characters and their perspective rather than narrative, or rather than narration. So that's Final Fantasy, and then we move on to... <laughs> <laughs> The dumbest dumb that ever dumbed. <laughs> How many of you have played Ratchet and Clank? Good. Wow. Excellent. How many of you have played anything other than the first game? I'm sorry. Oh. Oh. 
the, the game, ca- the, the ge- rest of the games are really fun, but they really help to undermine part of the first, the first game because of, going back to earlier, the narrative consistency. <laughs> Ratchet and Clank opens up with a very, very lighthearted, very whimsical world where you have uh, Ratchet, our nominal hero, who is basically a loser. His weapon of choice is a wrench because that's what he has handy. Uh, the Omni Wrench 3000 or something like that, and he just stumbles into this effort to become a world a, a world saving hero, multiple world saving heroes, because he's fighting against an evil corporation that is trying to build a new world by yanking different pieces of other worlds and gluing them together, because that's how that works. The universe is completely nonsensical. The, the universe is incredibly zany, borny, bordering on a Warner Brothers cartoon. And yet, it maintains this internal consistency largely through the dialogue between Ratchet and Clank to help establish when things are supposed to make sense and when they don't. So there's no guesswork about, is this normal for this universe? They make it clear through their interactions. It is a universe where capitalism has run amok and you can buy guns from a vending machine. (laughs) <laughs> and yet it is a world that is decidedly harmless in a lot of ways, where even the monsters that eat people just aren't quite that bad. And so everything is able to take a very comedic turn and very satirical, but it's still able to provide a great sense of gravity through these characters. Any questions? I was going to ask. Nick, did you have anything for me? No? Well, no, keep going. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm in awe. Oh, <laughs> it's just the shine off the top. No, of it. no. So, but but so you're saying that the that the original the original game possesses something that all the other that the that sequels do not. Excellent. So uh, yes, you're, you're very correct. Yeah. Um, the subsequent games, Going Commando, uh, and then all the other ones after that, Ratchet is not a reluctant hero at that point. He is somebody who has the profession of being a hero, and he gets tasked to go off and do things. It's kind of the difference between Luke Skywalker and Beowulf. Oh, I was just going to ask about how you compare that to Luke Skywalker. Um, <laughs> in the first game, he's the reluctant hero. Sure. He's just trying to get his car working. Clank is able to hook him up, and he just runs with things from that point forward. He's only so-so invested in the entire story until he gets really burned by the bad guys, and then it's more of a story of revenge for him than you know trying to save millions of people. Subsequent games take that away, and they make him this heroic figure that's having to go out. And he, he's asked from the forefront, will you do this? And he says yes. So it's a very unsatisfying character arc. I wouldn't necessarily say unsatisfying, but it is not as investing, and the character is not as rich. So he doesn't have the same vested interest that he does in subsequent games. So both of the franchises you mentioned, Final Fantasy and Ratchet and Clank, both have recently come out with games, both of which, in fact, I was reading, I was kind of surprised that there were some, there seemed to be some, there was a lot of anticipation for for the latest Final Fantasy, but some people have been either, this game is exactly what I've been waiting for, some people, most, no, I shouldn't say most, it's been sort of a half and half. Show of hands. Yeah, show of hands. How many people thought the last Final Fantasy was worth the 15. wait? Fifteen. He's talking about fifteen. Okay, maybe not. No, that's um, right. that's so so so. Hey, don't what, assume who's everybody's played, played it. it. Yeah, go first. Yeah, who's there played? Ah, okay, right. who's that played? It. All right, now keep your hands up if you thought it was worth the wait. So it's about half and half. Didn't beat it yet. Okay, okay. caveat. The, so asterisk. In their defense, um, the Final Fantasies have having a real problem where the game changes dramatically after like a week of gameplay. Right. Um, like, if you play for 140 hours, then suddenly it gets good. <laughs> so, I don't know if that's the so case. So, you got 140 hours to spare. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Okay. All right. Well, uh, Nick, you're up, and we're going to start with Nick's... Uh, Which one are we doing first? The f- we're doing these in chronological order, just like I told you guys. Oh. In the slideshow, that they never... <laughs> Oh my god! At? I was in the beta for this. I know I looked at it because I took. Are I you c- really? Oh yeah, dude. Yeah. Dude. Years ago. Yeah, he really looked at my presentation before he got here. I just want to <laughs> say that's not what he was saying. <laughs> so uh, this is going to actually touch on a lot of points that that Robert just made. Um, primarily being um, a lot of the the don't just spew it at me. Actually, you know, get me immersed in it. Right. So if you write, 
you write, I'm, I'm a comic book guy, so if you write like a comic book, you want to get immersed in the comic book. You don't want to just have a panel that says, okay, and uh, this is how we got to where we're getting, and there was a trade embargo, Phantom Menace, blah, blah, blah. So Asheron's Call, which sadly is back in the news because it's shutting down at the end of the month, um, started 17 years ago, and it was a turbine property, and it was uh, a lot of fun. And to one of the points that Rob made, it's not a beautiful game. It wasn't a beautiful game when it started. It was just kind of clunky. Um, but one thing that they did really, really well was they were consistent about putting out updates and changing the gameplay and keeping it fresh. And, and they did something that I don't think I've ever seen gamers, game designers do. Anybody in here have a, a career or a desire to be in game design? Okay, a lot of people, good. You're gonna be competing with my kid in about five years, so, so just keep it sharp. Uh, so, <clears throat> Back in the day, right, let's get off my lawn, uh, they had distinct servers, not just you log into this massive multiplayer game and it's just all mirrors and it's dynamic and all stands up and wherever you play your character exists and you just never know what server you're on. Back in the day, they were, they were standalone servers. And there were five that were regular and there was one that was PvP and if you wanted to get crushed and hate humanity, you got on the PvP server and that was how it worked. Um, so, originally in the first year, they had a storyline where you went into this castle and there was a crystal and it was eternal winter everywhere and if you broke the crystal, you restored the regular balance to the, to the world. Pretty cool, right? Looked like crap because you can see what the graphics look like, but it was a really cool storyline. Then, a couple, six, eight, nine months later, they said, oh, there's more than one crystal and you can get great tons of treasure and fame and fortune if you destroy all four crystals, right? Sound like the kind of thing you'd want to do in a video game where all you do is just level drive? But there's a catch. Uh, if you destroy all four crystals, you're going to release this guy, this demon, onto the earth, or onto the world. It wasn't earth. So the level cap at the time was 126, and this guy's level 999. So you have an idea of what kind of bad things you're doing to the world, right? Capitalist gone wrong. I want a couple of bucks, but in the, I'm just going to scorch the earth in order to get it. So they did something that game designers pay attention, because this is important. They had an event where, for the entire month leading up to the end of this storyline, you could go PvP, and you could try to destroy the crystals, or you could try to defend the crystals. It's a lot of fun, because even if you're not all the time into PvP, and you've got a character who only has to be temporary PvP when you're in this campaign, then you could do that. And there were a lot of people that tried to destroy the crystals, and on one server they did it in like three days. And then on one server they did it in like three weeks. And then on Thistledown, which is the only server, it was day 30, and the crystal was still in one piece. Now, as a game designer, you're telling your story, do you want to go from then on, moving forward, every time that you do a patch, have five servers that have this story and one server that has this story? You can't do it. You can't put the Q&A time in. You can't keep things consistent, as we talked about consistency. So, so the devs did what the devs had to do. They had their super god ninja dudes come in at the last night, and they slaughtered everybody, right? <laughs> and so the patch came out, and when the patch came out the next day, boom, the skies were raining blood, the rivers were running red, and Bale Zeron was out on all the servers. <clears throat> it's awesome. Actually, the first time he showed up on Thistledown, uh, there was a level six dude who saw him and went, ah, I just charged right at him and got nuked. So... <laughs> God love him. It was great. And there was this one town that was out in the middle of nowhere, and you could go up to him and ask him for transportation there, and he'd send you there for free, but he would send you there a 1,000 feet in the air, and then you would land and you'd get obliterated. So very, a lot of humor. But, I kind of feel like that, for, that level six guy that attacked the devil, they should have been like, you know what, we're giving you 1,000 XP. Yeah, oh, they yeah. should have, yes. Only the first one. Yeah. Right. Yeah, all, yeah, only the first one. Only the first one. Yes. They were... <laughs> I, I don't know if he, is, if he was the father of Leroy Jenkins. I'm not sure. <laughs> there's, there's a chance. There's a chance. Um, but go ahead and advance. So one of the things that they did, and it was the only, the only thing that was different is on that actual server is that they put up a, mom, a, a monument. You can advance it. I don't have that. Oh, you don't have it. It's just you a statue that has. It was in there when I looked at the presentation. No, it wasn't. Um, oh, I sent it to you, so you're lazy for not putting it in there. But uh, they had everybody who defended the crystal, so on that one particular server, it's the only instance of it. But that's a nice way to keep consistency in game design and keep the game going the way that you wanted it to, even when sometimes your gamers, all of you, 
don't do what the game designers expect. So it was interesting to adapt the story in that way. Okay. Yeah. We got next so, one. so the, uh, well, no, before, before we go to the next one, I just wanted to ask real quick. So, so you're saying that the 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 storytelling the storytelling to get the, is done right in Asheron's Call is not only is not only your your ability to immerse yourself into the story, but also the developer's way of manipulating you to do the story the way they want to tell. I think we all felt horribly robbed when the <laughs> Shadow Ninjas showed up on day thirty. <laughs> Uh, go ahead. I, well, I see over there. If I was going to say to support him, I, my my takeaway from his story is to make the re, make the interactor, the audience, whether it's readers, players, whatever, take the fork in the road that you want them to, but make them think it's your choice and your decision. Yeah, and ultimately, we all would have gotten robbed of that. Logging in the next day and going, "Holy crap! It's raining blood!" <laughs> like, and I'm so glad that they actually did it, and then. Because eventually, you know, you got to the quest where um, Bale Zeron, who looks an awful lot like the first version, like the grandfather of uh, the Taken King. Spoilers. Um, <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> so uh, that's a Destiny reference for those of you who don't play Destiny. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, you have to kind of get people to, to where you want them. You don't write a choose-your-own-adventure book with blank pages, you know? There you go. So your next one, the next one you, that you talk uh, about. Now this, I will take and tell you, it is a beautiful game. And I don't know how many of you with your 3DSs are playing it right now, but I will tell you... If you are, that is the highest compliment you could pay him right now. That's pretty good. <laughs> I put probably a, probably 150 hours or so into this game, mostly just because of the, the story and the soundtrack, because the soundtrack was unreal. And, and my kid probably put 100 hours into this game. And I don't know if they're here, but Video Game, ha Video game Haven out of Virginia Beach, I was in talking to the guy when this came out on the, D on the DS. I'm sorry if I'm leaning in too far, guys. Maybe you guys. Um, and uh, I told him, I was like, yeah, I put like 100 hours into that game on the Wii. And, and he goes, yeah, I did about the same. And I go, that's great. And he goes, my dad retired and is trying to do every side quest and event in the game. He's logged 940 hours so far. Man. Man. Wow. That man is my hero. <laughs> yeah. I think he's all our hero today. Yeah. Man, that's astounding. So, wow. so cool thing about this. So the, the, the two things that I love about this game, one is the world Jeez. building which is always important, right? You don't want to just, it can't all be side-scroll Super Mario too much. It can be, but you know, you run the limits. Uh, so one is the world building and the other is, is the character interaction, which you talked about, the importance of that. The world building here is the, the backstory, and you get it in the beginning in the intro, is that the entire world that, that your characters live on is the dead bodies of these two gods that were fighting for eons and eventually slaughtered each other and they have just been there. And one's the biological one and one's the mechanical one. And, and you start as this guy basically on like the foot of the biological god and, and you get attacked by the mechanical dudes. I'm, it's very simplifying this, trust me. And uh, you have the only weapon that can stop them. And so you have to eventually make your way throughout the entire landscape of the, of the two dead gods. It's just, just, but everywhere that you go had a different visual hue and a different soundtrack and different set of beasts and it, just, it was just incredible. Uh, visuals, but to have that as the backdrop is great. Because if go ahead, the the neat thing was also they had you had you had to backtrack often, mm. and so there were monsters that were a lot stronger that you learned real fast. I'll come back to you, <laughs> and, and so it the, the, the world became so much richer because there were areas that you you wouldn't come go to an area, do all the stuff, and then leave and never go back there. You would constantly be returning to the same right. area, but finding new things. And, that's right. Hey, you spider dudes who ate me when I was level 12, I'm level 60 now. Let's play. Right? So there was a lot of that. Um, and there's some guys who are only at night during a full moon, during a rainstorm. So God bless that guy's dad. I hope he finishes the game before, uh, before he dies. That's morbid, <laughs> but I tell you. He sounds close. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You can go a long time. So that was part of it. But the other thing is that, is that you build a party, and you've got a number of different characters who can be part of the party, and each of them can actually be the leader at different points in the game, and some people disappear for story purposes and come back. But there's actually an affinity chart. So as your characters are, are working together, not only does it increase how well they like each other and open up new dialogue, but it actually it opens up new abilities. So there are things that you can do because you've played this combination of characters that 
you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And there are things that you can succeed at and side quests and, and the main story is the main story, but there are, there are things that happen just because you have immersed the time getting these characters to like each other. And if you put up with the little pocket Ricky thing, God, I, even 100 hours is enough of that, dude. Um, <laughs> but it, it just changes everything that you're able to do within the game. And I, and I thought that that was an interesting dynamic, but also it gets back to think about how that works in the games that you like and the movies that you like and the things that you read, right? If, uh, if, if a certain set of characters never bury the hatchet, do they actually all get together and, and accomplish what they're trying to accomplish? I think we probably can all name games where that has to happen, right? They start off as enemies, but they have to eventually come together and, and, and work together reluctantly or otherwise, you know? So just that, that character affinity on top of just the, the beautiful visuals and the, and the stellar soundtrack, I think we're, we're awesome. I don't think I have anything else on that. Are we done? Yeah. That one? Good. Yeah. So now T gets to talk. I got to talk first. Oh, hold on. We're going to give you we're gonna have, we, we left ourselves short on purpose so we, we could ask questions. <laughs> yeah. So keep that. You're going to be our first one, dude who just raised his hand. Yeah. We're going to, yeah. Okay. Um, just remind me that you're, don't, don't, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> don't remind me. Okay. So yeah, um, as I said before, I'm, I'm a reluctant gamer because I lost many, many hours on my first pick. I lost a ton of time. In, back in the 90s on this one, yeah. Respect the classics, man. Respect the classics. Mist. Uh, the, 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 the storytelling element of Mist fascinated me when I, when I first played this game. Um, and, and I think what, what makes it such a fascinating game and still gets that response from people and, and touches everybody in that very special way is that Mist tells a story after the story's done. You basically wake up in this world and you have no idea where everyone is. You have no idea what has happened, but you've got to spend a lot of time trying to flip this lever or solve this puzzle to figure out what happened. And then when you figure that part out, it leads to another clue. Sounds like MAGFest on Sunday morning. It, it pretty much is. Um, <laughs> it, and and uh, I, I remember... I remember being exhausted after uh, performing in a show or, or, or something and getting back to my apartment, but then firing up that, that Apple IIe, no, not Apple IIe, I'm sorry, the Apple 7200, and playing Mist until at least 3 in the morning. I actually filled out the journal. and You can find that in the uh, computer museum downstairs. Later. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> if, you, if you're wondering, what, did the, what was that model? It's in the computer museum. <laughs> <laughs> And, and the, but the deeper you got into the game, the, the more the story revealed itself. And I remember uh, thinking that there were, other, there were other games that I was, I was playing back then, but, but Mist was the one that I always went back to. And I'm not sure what went wrong uh, in some of the sequels. I remember making it only uh, a few hours into Riven and saying, I'm done. And I'm not sure what what was missed, what Mist had that Riven didn't. Maybe it was that Riven was making the puzzles so hard that they were no longer entertaining. I think that's I think that's possible in a story. You can make a story that is so dense and that is so complicated, you stop enjoying yourselves. And to me, when you're in a story, when you're when you're being told a story, or when you're trying to uh, to uncover a mystery, if it's too hard, then why are we doing this to ourselves? Um, I, I, I hate to say this, and I know, I'm sure there are some fans out there, but I liken it to when I was watching The Walking Dead. Hey. Sorry. Um, it, it, you just woke up trying to figure out what happened to the rest of the humans, dude. Yeah, I know, and that was great. <laughs> but then after a while, it just it became, for me, it became misery porn. Um, and and I, I just couldn't slog my way through it. And, but with Mist, I think the, I think the, the, the storytelling aspect that, that we kept going back to was what happened here? What have we discovered? And, and what, you know, wh where are we going with this? And I think the payoff was worth it. Um, I, I, a good example of that in storytelling, uh, non non video game related. It just came out on Netflix. If you haven't seen it yet, I got him turned on to it. It's called Spectral. Oh. If you haven't seen Spectral on Netflix, do yourself a favor. This is a nice little sleeper that has kind of nested itself in the, in the depths of Netflix. And the payoff at the end reminded me of the of the payoff in Mist. Uh, the payoff in Mist, I was like, "Oh wow, this is where we were. This is this was where we were going." Okay, 
spoilers. Uh, <laughs> and it was the same thing in Spectral. So, so yeah, Mist, Mist has a, a very soft spot for me. So now we get to my, my current du jour to play. And I know I'm going to probably get some backlash on this. And if I do, it's OK, because I, I have a caveat for this. <laughs> I can just, there I can, we go. one guy, thank you. Um, it only takes one guy. It only takes one. Uh, I mean, true. yeah, uh, OK, so yeah, destiny. All right. You can see, especially if you're a writer, you can see the moment, the moment in the game where the writers basically put down their pads and pencils and said, we're out. <laughs> See ya! Because after that, it was, it, this is what I liken it to. It was like watching season five of Game of Thrones. To finish year one of Destiny was that. To finish the dark below was that. It was like getting through Game of Thrones season five. So we could get to season six. Or as I like to call it, the Taken King. Yes. The minute the Taken King came out, I was like, okay, this is the story I've been wanting to do. And we talk about consistency, and that was the feeling I got. There was more of a, of a thread, a consistent thread that I could follow as a part to just mow down bad guys, pick up stuff. Here, there were, there were actual stakes involved. There were now um, these super baddies that not, only the, uh, that not only you didn't like, but your enemy didn't like. So now you're fighting a battle on two fronts. And I remember being, uh, playing as the character in Destiny, being a little terrified when my gun would go off and the Fallen would turn around and the Taken would turn around and I'd go, I am so freaking screwed right now. Um, it, it, was, it, was, it, was a, it was a refreshing, it was, it was refreshing, a refreshing change that we finally had that consistency. And I think the consistency with, um, with, with, uh, with, with Destiny is that you are the character. You are the main character. And it is up to you to make the choices to move forward in the game. Um, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating uh, journey to take as a gamer because with each skill you, de you get, you improve in your, your, your abilities. And this was all, this was all new game, game mechanics to me. This is all brand spanking new. I know there are other games out there. I know there's Mass Effect. I know there's Skyrim. I know, I know. But I, haven't, I, don't, I don't have the time for that. But I remember sitting behind Destiny from, a, from a, just a visual standpoint going, this is going to totally screw up my productivity. <laughs> and it did. And I regret nothing. And, um, and, and to our earlier point, if this was the three characters, uh, T and myself and our buddy who we play with, his guy would be looking over there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But the, 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 the thing that I get the most excited about with Destiny is since The Taken King, they have been ramping up because they knew, and they and I give Bungie credit. They they owned it. They said, "We lost the writers. We're sorry. We're not going to let that happen again." That's when we got Rise of Iron. Now I don't know if for those of you who st who stick it out in Destiny, it's worth it to get to Rise of Iron because not only are you invested in yourself as a character, the other characters involved in this particular moment. You should find this cutscene in Rise of Iron. It it's the the boss battle that happened before, and you're picking up the pieces afterwards. And the look on this character's face when she gives up her life to, to, to shut down Siva, it's gut-wrenching. There are performances, there are, there are character-generated performances in The Taken King and in uh, Rise of Iron that I think rival some of the movies that have come out of late. Uh, it just just gut-wrenching stuff. And when you become invo emotionally involved with characters that, that are just pixels on a screen, albeit a lot of pixels on the screen, <laughs> it just, it, that to me is good storytelling because now you're invested emotionally. And it's that emotional investment that, that, makes a, that, that takes a story and makes it, a, takes it from a good story and makes it a great story. And um, what I've heard about Destiny is that for year two, which is supposed to be coming out, and nobody knows what's coming, they just know that the last, and this is the last report that I read, was that the, uh, the head writer from Mass Effect Andromeda, after he wrapped there, he went over to Bungie, and he is, he is, he's got a hand on what's, what's going on. I'm just gonna say it again, I have not played Mass Effect, but I have friends who've played Mass Effect, and they are beating me with a two by four to play Mass Effect, because they know how crazy I am about Destiny. 
But one other thing I do like about the storytelling aspect of Destiny is that you don't just become the main character, it's the people that you roll with that also become characters in this story, and each of them take their own personalities. He's the Punisher. He uh, likes. Like he's he's like, where's where's Nick? You know, no, uh, Nobilis is like, where's Nick? Where's Nick? He's punching somebody. Then you hear, boom, there oh, he is. Jesus. You didn't think I was coming? Boom, there he is again. I mean, it's just that's that's the way Nick plays. It's usually it usually goes like this. Hey Nick, make sure you don't punch those. Uh, yeah, they explode. And then Nick, and then that's when Nobilis turns on and goes, "Where's T? He's in the Where's other Where's T? Room. And he's like, oh, "He's in the other. He's in the other frontier. Don't worry, he'll get here eventually." He's fine. And then you hear the poof. Right. I'm not a very good driver. I'm not an excellent no. driver. Not an excellent driver. <laughs> um, but but the but the fact that you're you know it's that immersive that immersive storytelling and that immersive experience that you not only get with your friends. I think that ramps destiny that, that much higher, and that that's why it's so high on the on the scale for me. Um, so now we come to the point where we take your questions. We know we've got two mics. We got to start with we got to start with flannel shirt guy because he had a question so, ten minutes ago and I cut him off. Yes. So you, sir. Come yes. On. No, you you you. No 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 that sir. no that guy. Oh, I'm sorry, no. that guy there. Then you. How then is he flannel shirt guy? What is know. wrong with I you? I can't see. Okay, All you right, have to after flannel shirt. And then the dude in front. Got it. Hold on. It's See a non on guys. Just project. shout. Hold on. We oh, got here it. Here comes. Shout. Hey, uh, one more. Uh, shout. Big, Let it all out. Big props for the a uh, AV guys, please. They yep, because he's on it. Bless you. They know where the bodies are buried and where the on-off switches are. <laughs> That's very true. Wait, what? Yeah. They're buried at, where's your vendor table? <laughs> I'm hoping they're still going to be there. Killed them both. I'll give you one of these if you want. Let's see. Just shout. Project, sir. So, um, I'll repeat the question. You can ask us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I know. I bought the Wii U for the sequel, which I think next <laughs> next year our panel's got to be on sequels because all three of us have mentioned them now. <laughs> and the sequel has nothing to do with the first Xenoblade, but you were nodding. So does it work on the Wii U? Do you know, or does anybody in the room know? I have Xeno something on the Wii. Xeno no, but that doesn't answer his now question. Where I have no idea which Xeno is what. I know Xeno Gears and then Xeno other stuff. What do we got? People in the room? Thumbs up, thumbs down? Do you know? Wow. Christ, it's like trying to keep track Okay, so, of but do you know, DCU so does the Xenoblade Chronicles, the original game, play on the Wii U? No? You don't know. There you go. Sweet. There you go. Ask him answer. Okay. Um, wow has started doing something to remedy that because a lot of people myself included, don't care for MMOs for that very reason. It's like everybody who plays this game is gonna rescue the queen. We're just a person, we're not the hero. And I'm far too vain to play a video game and not be the hero. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what WoW has implemented is the very thing he was talking about not being able to do, they've done, where if you m complete a certain quest in World of Warcraft, the entire game changes for you. If you rescue this king, this village is now burned down and you can't buy anything that was in that village and these people have scattered to these other villages. But if another player hasn't rescued the king yet, that village is still there. 
And so there's an issue with having to balance what is available to whom, when, and where in relation, but it does give you a very serious sense of narrative progression. But only WoW, which is a world unto itself, can kind of do something like that. Most other MMOs have only attempted that and only to varying degrees of success. And even then, it's only three or four major steps in the game. Um, and the short answer in my experience is they don't, and that's why you should play single-player games, because MMOs are awful. Hey. But, but you see, this to me is why I get a little uptight when people say, yeah, the servers are down, the servers are slow, there's a lot of lag. I'm sitting there going, okay, you realize that there are five separate quests going on outside of you, Special Snowflake. <laughs> and, you, and, and, they're all, and, and in the case of WoW, they're all affecting each other. You know, it's not some it's not some guy with a ramped up PC going, I'm gonna make this thing so sweet. It's not that. It's it's a it's a server farm, the likes of which God has never seen. And it's trying to keep you on. Just you. No, there's a lot of there's a lot of things at play here. So whenever you do MMOs, there's some there's some give and take. Now, talking about single player and then the, the fate of your choices, one I didn't get a chance to cover was uh, Bioshock. Um, obviously, that should have been the one I should have covered. Yeah. Okay, uh, I just now to keep in mind. I I, uh, I I started Bioshock with Infinite, and then when the Bioshock collection came out, I said, "Ooh, I'll go back to the beginning and start start from scratch." And as I told the story earlier, my 12 year old came down and said, "Dad, what you doing?" I said, "I'm playing a game." Go upstairs. <laughs> go upstairs. I mean, I had, to, I had to address myself in the mirror and go, young man, that is just too intense of a game for you. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, that, that's sort of the advantage, disadvantage of the, of the MMO versus the single player. Yeah, the MMO is great to, to, to run with your pals, but sometimes you just want to chill out and immerse yourself into a really screwed up horror movie. So, you know, that's when you play Bioshock. Lego Star Wars. Or Lego Star Wars in your case. I love Lego Star Wars. <laughs> Uh, we had another question. We, we, had another, we had another question, and then stand by. Yep. Hey, hey it's Oregon. So, um, I heard a report that um, the best thing you can learn is that you guys play a lot of particular Regrettably. Oh. 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 I just wanted to get your opinions or takes on that. I guess yours isn't going to be so positive, is it? <laughs> the good news is we have an opinion. The bad news is he's the only one who has an opinion. So yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. Um, I I don't personally care for Halo, but it does have a rich story that's being told very well off screen, and so I do think that it do, that the Arbiter is going to be more. The, the more consistent character in very much the same way. The movie was called Mad Max, but it was really about Furiosa. I think that's a very similar comparison. That's, so that's yeah, a, that's a great comparison. Oh. One of the other things I'd like to, because you, you bring it up about telling the story off screen, it's that that that's sort of my love hate relationship with Overwatch, which is why I'm probably only at 13 level 13 while my kid is at 45. Little brat. Um, <laughs> But uh, I'm gonna tell her she said that. <laughs> Don't worry, we're podcasting it. So she knows. Weird. She knows. <laughs> oh no 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 no! no. If anybody thinks, wow, he's a bad. Well, let me, let, quick quick side story. So she gets loot gaming. She gets loot gaming. They had that beautiful last last month. They had that beautiful scarf. That beautiful Destiny scarf. She doesn't even play Destiny. And I said, I'm willing to trade for you. And we're we're doing this on pod. We're doing this on mic. She says, That's okay, Dad. And I went, what? And, she, and this is after she said, oh, yeah, I'll trade you, Dad. We get on mic. She goes, that's okay, Dad. Oh, I'll keep it. I'm like, you don't even wear scarves. And she was like, it's okay, Dad. I'll keep it. <laughs> I'm going to remember this child. I'm going to pull it out on the prom date like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> that being said. 
I the, take uh, it back. Your daughter's not my hero. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is that uh, I also got a scarf, and I told her to do that, so I could sell you one. Uh, oh, oh, really? <laughs> Nicely no, done. True. Nicely it's done. Nicely my, done. My girlfriend knits scarves. Does that count? No. No. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, so, so, but but that's the thing is that over the characters in Overwatch have all these incredible backstories, and then you get that series of films that Blizzard made that were amazing, and we don't get to play any of that in the actual game. We get, we get the characters, and yeah, they're consistent, but what I call Overwatch great storytelling? No, not really. And it's, it's, for me, that's a heartbreaking aspect of the game because I would really love to be able to play the story of what got Overwatch to the point of where it is now. What? They need yes, a story mode. They need a story mode. If I can, if I can story plug mode. real fast. Plug. Yeah, um, tomorrow, I have a panel on how to get into watching professional gaming, and it was the result largely of Overwatch and uh, Bull and Badger's podcast about it because I got really excited. Like, the, I've seen the visuals. I've seen oh. the characters. Yeah, Gorgeous. let's watch it. And then I watched competitive gaming. I was like, huh. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. You can come next. You can be next, young lady. I see you over there. Yep. So uh, a huge thing for me in how I like to game nowadays, especially in terms of storytelling and narrative design in games, is meta narrative. Um, and there were two games in particular I was wondering if any of you had played or had thoughts on, which are um, Spec Ops: The Line and The Stanley Parable. The, what was the second one? The last one. The Stanley Parable. I think I've heard of that one, but I, I definitely haven't played it. So, um, as a brief rundown of the first one, Spec Ops The Line, uh, the company purposefully advertised their game as something it was not, which was a clone of Call of Duty shooter, and then at the very end of the game, told you what a bad person you were for enjoying it. No, that's, that's dumb. <laughs> yeah, that's um, ridiculous. I mean, not, not just from like a business standpoint or something, but as a, as a fan, as a consumer of art, um, you can do stuff like that occasionally with like Undertale, but you, it, it's actually laid out up front that, but no, mm. that, no, that's bad. That's not <laughs> a thing people should do. Yeah. So to your point, so being the guy who likes to punch aliens in the face, I, I, I own it. Uh, there was a game, a little post-apocalyptic game, and basically you had to shoot your way through everything and you got to the very end and you had to talk the main bad guy out of everything. You couldn't, could literally could not shoot him. Like, wait a minute. Right, you're gonna do that to me at the very, very end? Don't do that yeah. to me. I'm, pun I'm punched aliens yeah, in the face guy. I know my job, mm -hmm. you know? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I can't hard. even really say too much about what the Stanley Parable is, just because you kind of got to play it. Show of hands, show of hands, show of hands. Whoa, Holy the hell? crap. <laughs> All right, what these, are your, these are your people. Yeah. What? Yeah. So it's, it's on not Steam. on a console? Then it's not a real video game. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, hold on. And now the and now the crowd turns. So glad there's this empty chair between the two of us. <laughs> so the Stanley Parable. The Stanley Parable <laughs> is a game um, in which uh, the narrator speaks to you, not so much you as in the character you play, Stanley. It narrates um, who the character is. It gives you a little context, and then you just go and do things. The thing is, the narrator immediately in the start of the game starts narrating things you haven't done yet. Like it says, Stanley then walks through the door on the left. However, there's two open doors. And then from then on, the game spirals out of control as it's the narrator trying to assert control over Stanley, where the player themselves is controlling Stanley and either going with what the narrator says or against the narrator. I own cats. I don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> Which you is know what? fine. Okay, so... so uh, and I, I, I'm a little older than you. Uh, <laughs> growing up on the text-based games, where like you had to go open door on left, like the fact that you <laughs> imagine that the guy who's playing the game says that, and then you go, I didn't open that damn left door. I opened the right door. Like just that, I think is going to be great. I'm going to go download that tonight. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I would say if there's not if there's not a satire that's the Stan Lee principle, like the friggin' yeah. Marvel creator Stan Lee, that needs to happen. Oh, that I thought you were talking like the Stan Lee Cup. Oh, yeah. no, well, that... No, 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 not Stan Lee, not Stan Lee. The Stan, Stan Lee Cup, Lee. the Stan Lee Cup parable. 
All right, so yeah, you had a question, and then the young one of the young like, ladies had a question too. So you could like, grab the next mic. Go for the hat trick. Yep. Yes. Oh well. Uh, okay. And NH survived 2016 apparently. NHL 93. God love him. Go ahead. Um, how do you guys play Dragon Age Origin by any chance? Dragon Age. Dragon I do Age not. Origin. I have, uh, but I but I have a I. We have a gaggle of we have a gaggle of writer friends that we do a that, that I do a retreat with, and Dragon Age is Dragon Age and Skyrim. Uh, if it isn't Dragon Age, it's Skyrim. But that's basically their kryptonite. Well, the um, reason why I ask th is oh. go ahead. What? No, mostly the reason why I ask is for Dragon Age Origin is like like the characters interact with each other. So if you do one thing, the characters do something different. I played all the characters' routes. I played like a hundred hours for each each oh. route. So like I know I played all the swords. But the reason why I played the most of it is because they all interact, and like what uh, one of the games you mentioned earlier is how the one like in, how the interaction affects the game. Do you have you? What's your thoughts on that for Dragon Origin? I think that's the entire benefit of video games as an artistic medium is the ability to be interactive, and the more your actions can affect the world around you, the better. And that's that's the fun of the medium. Otherwise, read a book, watch a movie. I mean, and that's that, that's the Passive. and that's the appeal of, of good storytelling is that it, it keeps bringing you back into the game. Um, the, another old another oldie but goodie. And when I went back and, and looked at the game, I was like, yeah, the mechanics of this game are clunky as crap. But I remember loving it, especially because it had this brand new thing called cutscenes. Um, it was a it was a game called Phantasmagoria. Oh yeah, yeah. I am like I said, I'm an old fart gamer. Um, yeah, it is, uh, because the, the actual mechanics itself would usually just walk over here and pick up this, this bottle, and that would be it. But that would unlock this really creepy, creepy cutscene, and your, the, the interaction part is, I made that happen. I made that happen. And they build it as an interactive horror movie, and it was. It was absolutely terrifying at some points. But uh, yeah, Phantasmagoria um, had that, that same kind of ability, and that's, that's what made it such a strong, for, especially for its time. It made it a strong video game. Of course, we play it now, and it's a bit like, play, it's, it's a bit like going back and playing Titanic Adventure Out of Time. There's a nostalgic air to it, but, uh, and, and again, a great interactive, uh, what, you don't know the game? No. Okay, so. The story of Titanic. Oh. No, no, no. You're going down a rabbit. I'm, I'm a, a, a tiny rabbit. This hole. young lady has one question before you're done. So why don't you go ahead and come on up because I will go down the rabbit hole. But I'll, right. just to just to make a long story you're short. You're sinking the panel like the Titanic. Yes, I am. <laughs> but the but the, the storytelling element of that is you are now an interact you are now interacting with the Titanic disaster, and that was a that was a pretty powerful, pretty compelling story. But yeah, again, it was the interactive nature of that that made it so. Compelling, and that still works for games today. Okay, based on uh, which mic is working? This uh, one? It was the first one. Whichever oh, one okay, you can get gotcha. close to. Okay, so. Uh, closer than that. Oh, uh, my name's Marge. No, no, get closer to the microphone. One more step. Thank you, Marge. Okay. Oh, excellent. All right. <laughs> so, I've heard a lot of designers say you've got to be very careful with your story because if it's too plot heavy, it kind of overwhelms the the gameplay of it a little bit. Uh, is there a balance that needs to be achieved between plot element and interactivity, and how do you find that balance? That's a, that's a great Sorry. that's a great question to end on, Robert. Um, it is entirely circumstantial. Um, no, it, it really is. It's going to depend. Mario has as much story as it needs. Zelda has as much story as it needs. Halo has as. Um, oh. <laughs> wow! Wow! You, 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 you are just going to have to. All right. Walk. If you want to direct any comments uh, <laughs> to, to Robert, his website is up here. <laughs> Third, he is the third person on each of these lists. Send your hate mail there. Go ahead, Robert, please. Um, it's it, been a long time since we've been on a panel, hadn't it, bro? It <laughs> I miss it so much. Um, it, it, it's something that you have to create in the moment, and it's that way with every medium. If you have too many lyrics in a song, you, 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 it'll overrun the melody. If you have too much dialogue in a movie, if you have too little, it, it, it's always situationally specific. Um, Portal doesn't really have a plot, except kind of at the beginning and at the end, but it, it, the plot that it does have is masterful. And so it, it's really just something that's gotta be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. Guys? Uh, yeah, to that point, you're gonna get casual gamers and you're gonna get magfest people, right? <laughs> and so you can't please all the people all of the time, but I think, to your point, there, it, it's a little bit of a, of a spectrum. 
and some every every gamer and even the same gamer depending on the game is going to be somewhere along that spectrum right up I'll, I'll put hours and hours and hours into NHL 14 because I it's a hockey game you know and I can turn my brain off and go play that um, but there are other times where I'm like okay it's kind of like watching television where you can multitask I can be doing something else and watching this and it's really entertaining or there's too much going on for me to actually be doing anything else right and so think of that same approach to gaming you're going to enjoy each of those just depends on where you are and, and how the story engages you but I think what you your question was excellent that's a wonderful wonderful analogy I like the television analogy but to further build on that it even can depend on the episode and in games it can depend on the individual moment and mission you're on how much narrative is going to be significant I'm sorry no it's all right and uh, what I would say, what I would say in closing would be that um, that there are some games that, that are, are doing that. Destiny, for example, if you aren't big on the quest, then don't go on the quest. If you don't want to do the storyline, don't do the storyline. But if you want to do a raid with your buddies, if you want to go PvP on the Crucible, or if you want to do those idiotic Sparrow Racing League races, then you go on ahead and do your idiotic I Look, I can't drive the Sparrows, okay? All right. But, um, but that being said, I, I mean, I, I get my story fixed doing the quests. I will also get my, but if I have a bad day at work, you know I'm heading to the Crucible. And, and that's, that I think some games have figured out. They're like, you know, we want to be a one, and that's what, that's what a lot of, I think a lot of developers are doing. They're trying to do a one size fits all. And I think that is where Overwatch missed a step. They have, they have the PVP, they have the, PV, uh, they have the player versus AI, but they don't have a story mode. They should have a story mode for nerds like me. And, and, uh, and I, I think that you're, you're gonna see more games become that epic, not necessarily for, let's see how much downloadable content we can sell, but let's see if we can make this the one-stop shop for everybody. And uh, fantastic question to end on. Here's where you can find us online. And uh, I know, Rob, you've got a panel coming up. you got a panel yeah. coming up? I've got a bunch of panels this weekend. My next one is the Sundering Fandom, where we'll be talking about hardcore gamers versus casual gamers. That is at 7 o'clock, I believe, in panels three. And then in panels four. four. Yeah. Yeah. In panels four, Saturday night, 11 o'clock, Nick and I are going to be giving a, a presentation and giving away stuff. Uh, the panel is called... The panel is called um, Slightly Off Key. This is a follow-up to the big score, if you saw that last year. But this is called Slightly Off Key, Fantastic Soundtracks to Truly Terrible Films. <laughs> and um, it, we pretty nope. much, we start with, uh, we start nope, with. No, no, no teasers. No teasers? No, you got to come. No teasers. You got to come. Find us afterwards and we'll yeah, talk. And we'll talk about it. Thank you all very much. And hey, Thank you guys. enjoy MAGFest. <laughs> Woo!